This morning we're going to um, look at uh, the Bible or the story about the burial of Jesus. So the uh, title of the sermon is The Burial of Jesus. We've been going through the life and work and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ through the book of Mark for several months now. And uh, we've come to the point now where he's come to Jerusalem during Passion Week. He has argued with people in the temple. Uh, he's won every argument. He's spoken like no man ever spoke. He has uh, been agonized, uh, uh, agonizing in the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, he has set his face as a flint to the cross at Calvary. We see that he was betrayed. He, he was wrongfully arrested. Uh, he was tried in a, an, illegal, an illegal trial by the Jews and by the Romans. He was sent before Pilate, he was scourged, and he was driven up the hill at Calvary. He was nailed to the cross, and he laid his life down for us. I was on Good Friday morning at 9 o'clock in the morning. And by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he bowed his head and said, it's finished. And he was. He won the victory for us for all eternity. We're now going to pick up the story from that point on. And it, when I first read the story of the burial of Jesus, I was thinking it was quite a depressing story. But, but actually, it isn't. It's, it's not. It's a, it's a really uplifting story because it tells us about the courage of one man, Joseph of Arimathea, and how God used him. It also tells us about the fulfillment of prophecy, how God fulfills his prophecy and the providence of God. And it also tells us how God calls. It tells us about his calling. And those are going to be the three subjects I wanted to bring this morning. But we will pick up the story from Mark, chapter 15, verse 42, uh, reading to the end, uh, to, the, to verse uh, 47. Uh, it is recorded in Matthew, Luke, and John, but we will read it in Mark. So we're picking up the story now. Good Friday afternoon. Uh, it's three o'clock, Jesus bowed his head and died, and now let's see what happened next. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marvelled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. May the Lord bless his word to us. Now this story of the burial of Jesus, when I started to look at it, it's actually part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ who died for us, was buried and rose on the third day. So we often concentrate on the death of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, or we concentrate on the rising of Jesus, the resurrection. But we don't often think too much about the burial of Jesus, but it's really important because it's part of the gospel message of how God has set us free from the bondage of our sin. And in actual fact, in all of the creeds down through history, the burial is mentioned. The burial is mentioned. In the Nicene Creed, in the Apostles' Creed, it's mentioned because it's important to remember he was buried as well as he rose again. Now this story of um, the burial of Jesus, uh, we read of a man called Joseph of Arimathea. Now Joseph of Arimathea is only ever mentioned in the Bible in this story. He's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible other than in the story of the burial of Jesus. But he is mentioned in all four of the Gospels of this account. And there's some time devoted in the scriptures to Joseph of Arimathea. So I did do a study on Joseph of Arimathea and this passage. And from it, I gathered that there would be 
really three sort of areas I wanted to bring this morning from this passage. As I say, one of them is to look at courage. What does it mean to take courage, like it says here in verse 43 of our reading, Joseph of Arimathea took courage. What does that mean? And secondly, I would like to look at how this story fulfills prophecy, because it is um, really quite amazing how God works in providence in the events of man that shows that he is in control and that he is unfolding history exactly according to his plan. And thirdly, I'd like to look at the callings of God, because clearly Joseph of Arimathea was called. He was the right man for the right job at the right time. So let's look first at this issue of courage, the courage of Joseph of Arimathea. Now John, in John's account, in the Gospel of John, he tells us in chapter 19 that although Joseph of Arimathea was a believer because it says he was a disciple of Jesus, although he was, and Matthew records that as well, he was a believer, he was a secret one for fear of the Jews. He was a secret one for fear of the Jews. So we read that he had fear, but we also read that he took courage. So having courage doesn't mean that we don't have any fear. So being fearless is not the same as being courageous. It's okay to be fearful and also take courage. Courage and fear can live side by side quite happily. But courage has to be taken, whereas fear comes upon us. Now his fears, when I was thinking about his life, would have been quite legitimate and quite understandable. Imagine it, Joseph of Arimathea. He was about to show his allegiance to Jesus Christ, who's just been crucified, who's just been rejected by the Jews. He was going to face scorn, he was going to face ridicule by the Sanhedrin. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, one of 71 privileged people at the top of the tree of the Jewish culture. Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Sanhedrin. And yet he, here he was going to, going to ask for the body of Jesus and bury Jesus. Think about that, of how he was going to be rejected. He must have known full well what was going to happen. And then he also had to face the Roman authorities, didn't he? Imagine that, going to Pilate. How would he react? Would, would the Romans mock him? Would they humiliate him? Would they lock him up, thinking perhaps he's part of this so-called sedition that Jesus was accused of? Or would they kill him? Would they arrest him and crucify him like they did Jesus? Just imagine that, awaiting in Pilate's court. Do you remember what it says? He went, the Pilate went and checked with the centurion that Jesus was, was dead. So there would have been a time when Joseph of Arimathea would have been sitting there in, that, in the courts of Pilate, wondering what Pilate's decision would be. And all of the Jews would have been toing and froing because they were trying to do deals as well to cover up the death of Jesus and make sure that nobody said that the body was stolen away. They would have been all looking at him as he sat there waiting for Pilate's decision. Imagine that, the pressure and the courage required for Joseph of Arimathea. When you start to think of it, you start to really appreciate how much courage he really must have had. <coughs> Yet he made that conscious decision to take courage and step out in faith. He took that consciously, despite his fears, because we know he was fearful, and despite his awareness of the potential consequences of what he was about to do. What courage he must have had. Now, he could have said to himself, wait a minute, I've, I've done enough. I didn't vote <coughs> for the crucifixion of Jesus when, as a member of the Sanhedrin, I had a vote. I, I voted that he should not be crucified, therefore I've done enough. And we know that he, did, he, he didn't agree to the crucifixion because it's recorded in Luke 23, 51. But, you know, sometimes it's not enough just to hint at your allegiance to Jesus. 
you know, sometimes we, somebody sneezes and we say, bless you, and we think, well, that's it. You know, we've now witnessed to them about Jesus. <laughs> it's not enough. <laughs> it's not enough. And sometimes we might say to somebody, oh, well, I can't see you Sunday, I'm going to church, and think that's enough. Sometimes we might even say, oh, well, I'll pray for you. You know, Joseph of Arimathea did an amazing thing. He, he stood up in the council and did not vote for the crucifixion of Jesus, but that wasn't enough for Joseph of Arimathea. Sometimes we need to be more positive than just hinting that we are a Christian, that we belong to Jesus. Now, we may not be hiding our light under a bushel, but we may be stopping short of putting it on a lampstand for all to see, as we should. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Now the Bible says the fear of man brings a snare, Proverbs 29. And it can stop us from shining for Jesus. Fear. The fear of not fitting in with our friends, our work colleagues, our fellow students, our family members, club members. All this type of fear would have been the same type of fear that Joseph of Arimathea would have felt. But he took courage and he stepped out for Jesus. And this is what we should do. Now this fear is not from God because we know God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. There was a, a quote I read during the week from um, Martin Luther King Jr., the, um, the great uh, social reformer and the, the preacher in the 50s. He said, fear knocked on the door and faith answered and there was no one there. And that is what it is like. Sometimes we have to feel the fear and do it anyway. Because fear is an enemy of the gospel. Now many of us have heard this question before. But I think it's good to ask ourselves again. If following Christ were a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Think about that. I think it's a good question to ask us regularly. Is there enough evidence? I hope so. Let's be encouraged by the courage of Joseph of Arimathea, what he showed amongst his peers and to the ruling authorities of the day. You know, there's ruling authorities today that we might need to stand up to, like Joseph of Arimathea did. There may be a stand that we will be called to take. There may be a stand that we are called to take amongst our neighbours, our friends, our family, our peers, the people we know, people we used to know. Now, Joseph of Arimathea, was he fearful? Yes. Did he agonise, perhaps over his decision to stand up for Jesus in the way he did by asking for the body of Jesus? I believe he did. After all, Jesus died at 3pm. And our reading says, now when evening had come. So I don't know how many there are, hours there are between 3pm and when evening has come, but there would have been some. And in that time, he would have been agonising, should he ask for the body, or shouldn't he? It could mean the end for him. Was his theology perfect? No. I mean, if he was expecting Jesus to rise after three days, he would not have had a huge stone rolled in front of it. He would have not have bound him with grave clothes over and over again and spices. Why would he, if he believed he was going to rise in three days? You don't have to have perfect theology. You don't have to have any lack of fear. You may agonise over your decision, but at the end of the day, we must stand up for Jesus. Because he will secure a reward for us in heaven. This is what the Bible means about storing up treasure in heaven. That's how we do it. Now God approved of him and he will receive a well done, good and faithful servant from the Lord. And the same will be true of us if we take courage and stand up for him. So that was the first point I wanted to make from this passage to encourage us to take courage 
like Joseph of Arimathea did, despite all of his faults. Now, the second point I would like to make is how this passage fulfills prophecy. Because once we see how it fulfills prophecy, we can gain more and more wonder and amazement and trust in the word of God. Now, under Roman law, crucifixion was not the end of humiliation (coughs) for condemned criminals. Yes, it was a humiliating experience ending in death, but that wasn't the end of the humiliation. Now, under normal circumstances, Jesus, like all the other crucified people, would either have been left to hang on the cross for a few days with his body rotting away on the cross for everyone to see, along with the other criminals. That was a possibility. Or he would have been cast straight into the city refuge tip with all the other criminals. The refuge tip outside Jerusalem called Gehenna. That would have been the norm. Now, in exceptional circumstances, the Romans may have allowed certain bodies of certain criminals to be taken by close relatives and buried. But Jesus was no relative of Joseph of Arimathea, let alone a close one. And the crime that he was accused of was sedition. That is to say, they said he was king of the Jews, perhaps a threat to the Roman Empire. That was the case that the Jews brought before the Romans, that he was calling himself above the rulers of Rome. Sedition. So it would have been very, very unlikely that they would release the body of a criminal accused of sedition. After all, they do not want him to be made a martyr and therefore an uprising ensued. So the burial of Jesus was orchestrated by God. God had a plan of what would happen to Jesus between the crucifixion and the resurrection. And he would supernaturally be involved to ensure that his will was done in respect of the burial of his one and only son. Providence would take over and biblical prophecy would be fulfilled. See, man is not actually in control. God is in control. And he brings about his purposes. Man would say the body would be thrown into the rubbish tip and burnt up. But God said no. And God's will prevailed. Jesus, to fulfil scripture, had a dignified and an honourable burial. This was supernaturally orchestrated by God and prophesied throughout the Bible. Let me bring you just three prophecies. <coughs> Isaiah 53, 9. Scripture tells us rather cryptically that the Messiah would be assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man in his death. Okay? Psalm 53, written some 500 years before. What did that mean? Nobody knew until Jesus was buried with the rich. It's exactly what happened. His grave was assigned with the wicked in the rubbish tip, but God saw to it that he was with a rich man in his death by calling Joseph of Arimathea, who we know was a rich man, according to Matthew 27, 57, which says so. And he would give him a dignified and rich man's funeral and burial, exactly as prophesied by Isaiah 53, verse 9. Absolutely, letter for letter, fulfilled in the burial of Jesus. Then Matthew 12, 40, the second one, Jesus prophesied that he would be three days and nights in the grave, that he could not have, that could not have happened if his body was thrown into the city rubbish tip and burnt up with all the rubbish and the other criminals. Could not have happened. So, so in God's providence, he called Joseph of Arimathea to put Jesus in a grave and a tomb in the heart of the earth where it would remain for three days, exactly as prophesied in Matthew 12, verse 40. So we've had an Old Testament prophecy and a New Testament prophecy. And here's the final one, the Apostle Paul. This is both in the New and the Old Testament The Apostle Paul reminded the people in Antioch in Acts 13.35, look it up, of another prophecy fulfilled in the way that Jesus' body was buried. This is what Psalm 16.10 says, this is what Paul quoted, 
you would not allow your Holy One to see corruption, referring to the, the body of Jesus, the Messiah. This again proves that the burial of Jesus was all orchestrated and controlled by the providence of God. Jesus' body would have seen corruption if it was burnt up in the rubbish tip or cast into a mass grave for criminals. It would have been corrupted. But it was not because it was preserved in a borrowed tomb for three days. Miraculously, really. Now, it would have started to suffer corruption if it was in there for any more than three days. But God raised him from the dead on the third day, so it didn't. Can you see how God fulfills his word? There are other references, but the principle is his burial is the fulfilment of many prophecies in the Bible. So in addition to his courage, Joseph of Arimathea also did what he did by the providence of God. Yes, he exerted his own courage. He took courage, but God was working with him. And it was God's providence that made him do what he did. The events were a fulfilment of prophecy, showing us yet again the veracity of the Bible, its truthfulness, its reliability, its everlasting nature. These prophecies were written hundreds of years before they were fulfilled. And it shows us the way God uses people to fulfill his purposes. And then that brings me to my third and final point, the callings of God that we can learn from this passage. The callings of God. I don't know if you've ever experienced the calling of God. The calling of God to a human being. Many of us have. And there may even be people here today or listening on YouTube who don't quite know what's happening to them and why they're listening to a sermon or why they're interested in the Bible. It's the calling of God. That's what God does. He calls. It's what he did in the Garden of Eden. Adam, Adam, where are you? When Adam fell. See, he calls because he cares. He doesn't just leave us. He calls. So the callings of God, there's no doubt that God called Joseph of Arimathea to do what he did. But it wasn't his first call to Joseph of Arimathea, was it? No, his first call to Joseph of Arimathea was to come to him. His first call was to surrender his life to God. That was his first call. Now, perhaps you're here today or listening on YouTube because you hear his first call to you. You may have heard it over many years, but it's still his first call. That was my experience. I experienced his first call when I was very young, maybe 10, 11 years old. But I didn't respond until I was 21. And yet it was his first call. His first call to you says that there is a God. It's number one. There is a God who loves you and who wants a personal relationship with you. That's part of his first call. He says, I'm real, I love you, and I want a relationship with you. Now there's a whole clamour of voices that would say that's stupid, wrong and untrue. But that's God's call. He tells you the truth. And his first call says that you've offended him by what the Bible calls sin, which is the breaking of divine law. See, God tells us the truth. He calls us, but he calls us to say we've offended him. Offended him deeply by sin. Breaking his divine law. And we're talking about man's standard. We're talking about God's standard. God is, a, is offended. And his, calls, his first call says that because of our sin, the judgment on that is death. The wages of sin is death. Why is there death? The Bible tells us because of our sin, our disobedience. It doesn't make any sense, death, does it? Life becomes meaningless when you think we're all going to die. And yet when we consider God, it becomes meaningful. The wages of sin is death. And then his first call also says, after death comes a judgment. 
as a face-to-face with our maker. Every one of us has a face-to-face. All of us will face him. That's what the Bible says. It's all part of his first call. And since he's 100% holy and just, your eternal soul, God says, after your body dies, will not be with God in heaven, but without God in hell. That's our natural state. That's the state we're born into. That's the position we start life off in. Not with God in heaven when we die, but without God in hell when we die. And so how can that be a gospel message? How can that be good news? Well, because we haven't got to the punchline. The good news, the gospel message, has to be preceded by that bad news. Otherwise it wouldn't be good news. But the good news is God so loved the world That is to say, you and me, he so loved us as individuals with all our faults, with all our hang-ups, with all our problems, he still loves us. We're made in his image. That's what he created us for, to love us and to have a relationship with us. God so loved us that he gave his only begotten beloved son. That is Jesus, who died in your place and my place on the cross at Calvary. That's how much he loves us. That much. On the cross he died for us. That whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, that is to say anyone, who believes that he paid the penalty for your sin, shall not perish, that means in hell, eternal judgment of God, but have everlasting life, that means in heaven and eternity with God. So that's good news, isn't it? So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's his first call. His first call is to surrender to him, to allow him to be Lord of your life, to ask him to come into your heart, and forgive you of all your sin. And that was God's first call to Joseph of Arimathea. And it's his first call to you. And if you answer his call and say yes to him, then in addition to becoming a citizen of heaven for all eternity, he will live in you and he will start to change you. And there will then be specific things that he will call you to do For his glory. It's not just a free ride once we're saved. He calls us to do things. He wants to be glorified in in us once we've answered his first call. And that's why he gives us subsequent calls after the first call. Now in our passage this morning we see that Joseph of Arimathea had a subsequent call to bury Jesus. God uses the right man for the right job And Joseph of Arimathea was the right man for this job. He put you in the right place at the right time for the right job. Now, for Joseph, it had to be someone who was rich enough to have his own tomb because God wanted his own son to be laid in a tomb of a rich man that had never been used before. Joseph of Arimathea had that. Joseph had to have influence amongst the important people like Pilate because otherwise he would not have got a hearing before Pilate. He would have just been thrown out of court before he got anywhere near Pilate. And yet he had that standing in society whereby he could get an audience with Pilate. And it had to be Pilate. No one else could release the body. It also had to be someone with the right character and personality. We are all different, aren't we? We're all made differently. You know, I look at what some people do and I think I could never do that. I could never be like that. And I'm sure they say the same about me. <laughs> so there, there, there's, there's a character and there's a personality to each one of us and God can use that particular character or personality for his glory. Joseph of Arimathea had to have the right social standing. He couldn't have been just somebody off the street. He would not have got a hearing with Pilate. He had to be the, a person that mixed with the right people. His tribe, his people group 
And we've all got a tribe and a people group. And God can use us in that tribe or people group. Like he used Joseph of Arimathea. You see, when God calls you to do something, he calls the right person at the right time to do it. And what God calls us to do, he equips us to do. It's not like he just says, right, I want you to go and do that, and I'm taking a step back and see how you get on. No, he doesn't do that. He works with us. See, Emmanuel is God with us. He's involved in our day-to-day lives. He calls us because he wants to show his glory through us, through our obedience to him. In the same way as Joseph of Arimathea was called as the right man for the right job at the right time, so God may be calling you as the right person for the right job at the right time. It's an uncomfortable thing to be called by God. It's uncomfortable to stand up and preach. It's uncomfortable, but it's a calling. May I respectfully ask you, What is God calling you to do? And before you consider your answer, may I remind you, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Don't say there's nothing for me to do. If you're a Christian, if you're saved, you're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. But you say, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it alone. Moses said that and God brought Aaron to help him. We see that all through the Bible that God brings people to help. People that we would never have thought of. I've seen it in my own life. What he calls us to do, he equips us to do. We have to step out in faith He will provide the means for it to be done. He can bring the right companion at the right time for the task that we are called to do. We might not know where they're coming from. We might not see them, but we must step out in faith. In Joseph of Arimathea's case, it was Nicodemus. Now, we don't read of Nicodemus in the account we read in Mark, but if we were to look in John's account in chapter 19, we will see Nicodemus appear on the scene and help take down the body of Jesus and help wrap it up in bandages and buy a hundred pounds worth of spices to anoint his body with. Nicodemus was also called by God to help Joseph of Arimathea. God was pulling the strings. God was doing the calling. These guys were just responding to his call. Nicodemus was the right man for the right job. He had enough money to buy those spices. You know, a hundred pounds of spices would have been more than a king would have been anointed with. More than a king. That's how much Jesus meant to these men. Nicodemus would have also had to face his fears. Nicodemus was the one who came to Jesus by night. So we know that he was very concerned about his reputation for seeing Jesus, being associated with Jesus, being having Jesus' name on his lips. He was very concerned about that at the time. And in John 3, 3, we know that Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born from above. You must be a new creation. You can't follow me in your old nature and your old ways. You've got to submit everything to me and I will fill you with my spirit and then you will be born again as a new creation that can serve me that can have fellowship with me, that can live with me forever. You must be born again. And we know that Nicodemus did respond to his first call from God, and God then subsequently called him to help Joseph of Arimathea. This is the providence of God to help us walk in our calling. Where did Nicodemus appear from? The Bible doesn't really tell us. I mean, there were no mobile phones. He wouldn't have got a Facebook message saying, I'm up at the cross, can you come and help me? I can't get the body down. Because he wouldn't have been able to do it on his own. Imagine it, pulling the hands and feet through the nails. Imagine it. Probably best not to. He couldn't have done it on his own. 
If you are a Christian here this morning, that is to say you have responded to his initial call and committed your life to him, be encouraged because what God calls us to do, he provides the means and the encouragement for us to do it. What we have to do is take courage and exercise faith. That's our part. But he calls us and he will equip us. We just need to have the courage to respond to his call, like Joseph of Arimathea did. And those are the, really the three points I wanted to bring out um, this morning. The courage, the fulfilment of prophecy, and the callings of God. So shall we pray to finish? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that there are so many rich treasures that we could read this, these five or six verses and speak on them for hours because there's so much in your rich treasury. But we thank you, Lord God, for the three gems that you've brought out for us this morning. We thank you that we can look at them and consider them during this coming week. We thank you, Lord God, that there's power in your word. We thank you, Lord God, that your word is living and active. We thank you, Lord God, it's not man's word, but it's your word. And it can divide between bone and marrow, it can cut to the heart. I'm so grateful, Lord God, for that living word. Help us not to be secret believers for fear of the people around us. Help us to take courage, to step out in faith, and do those good works that we see that you have already planned for us to do. Show us what they are, Lord. Help us not to make excuses for disobeying you. Oh, I've already said bless you. I've already said I go to church. Help us, Lord, not to make excuses for disobeying your call. Take away any fear of man from us and show us that it does bring a snare. Lord, we want to build up the evidence to convict us of being a follower of you. Would you please help us? Thank you too for showing us yet again the truthfulness of the Bible in its fulfilment of prophecy and the way you use people to fulfill your purposes. And finally, Lord, please encourage anyone here today or listening on YouTube that does not yet know you to respond to your call to them to come to you to avoid the penalty of hell without you and to gain the peace of heaven with you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.